sad sign. Okay, we're back. We're live with the 12 o'clock rock. Now write this down. Eden Lee Murray. That's Eden Lee Murray. <laughs> She's the director of the uh, Hawaii Theater down the block here. And we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about so many things. We'll talk about Hawaii Theater Center's um, uh, training program for young people who actually do plays in, in grade school and high school. And Eden makes that happen, among other things. Ah, Welcome to the show, thank Eden. Thank you so much, Jay. It's an honor to be here. It's yeah. really a pleasure. We only really had about half the show in the last five minutes because <laughs> we were spilling all our things, our thoughts out, you know. Now An actor can say something again and convince you it's the first time. Very good. All right. I want that. All I right. want that. Yeah. You know, usually you worry about that. I'm not worrying about it today. No. So um, first, let's, let's get this on the table. We got the Hawaii Theater has public performances on Friday, April 22nd at 7 p.m., Saturday, April 23rd at uh, 2 p.m., and the tickets are really cheap. These cheap, uh, without getting you the exact amounts, they're between $5 and $10. Wow, that is cheap. That's and this is for Shakespeare. This is for Shakespeare. Shakespeare done right. Thank you very much. That's exactly <laughs> right. This so that'll be the title <laughs> of our show today. Shakespeare done right. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's our goal. That's our aspiration. Yeah. These kids I train, I've got a wonderful uh, bumper crop of them this year, 22 of them from all over the island, some homeschooled, freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors from schools, public schools, private schools. They have to audition by competitive audition during the summer. There's a competitive callback, and then from that, I call a company. Like what, the real world. Like the real world, but <laughs> there's another step. There's another step that I find it's really important to the training that I do with these kids. One is, I think it's wonderful that they're good. And I think it's wonderful that they bring in monologues that shine and let them shine. But the second part of our audition is to bring those called back up on stage. And I conduct a master class in creative dramatics, improvisation, theater games. And when we're doing that together, I look for the kids who are the look at me actors, because I'm not interested. I look at the kids who support each other, even in a competitive situation, even though they don't know each other. Because part of what I teach in the training is not just acting technique. It's not just working with Shakespeare. It's how to be a member of an ensemble, which is a life skill that serves them, not just if they A life skill for life. A life head. skill for life, exactly. Whether they go on or not into, into professional theater, and a number of them have from the program. But what pleases me more is that the actors that have gone on to work with professional directors here, the directors inevitably come back to me and they say, not only are the kids that come out of the program really good, they are dependable, they do their work, they accept direction, they ask questions, and they arrive on time. Which for <laughs> us, the training is if you're there 15 minutes early, you're on time. If you show up at call time, you're late. But I'm training professionals. Yeah. Wow, you were bowled me over with this. Uh, how did you get into this? I mean, you're obviously in all the way. Yes, well, it, it, it is. It's fascinating. I'm a professional actor. I'm a member of Actors' Equity, Screen Actors Guild. I've been doing it since I was five years old. I think my mother was a brilliant actress. I grew up watching her on stage. But you seem like an ordinary person. I am. <laughs> I told, she made sure that was the case. I would come home from doing leads in high school plays, and she'd yeah. say, your chores. You've got to make the bed. It's your night for the dishes. And say, Mom, can I just bask in the glory? No. You're a member of this household. You're a member of this ensemble. I love it. Deal with it, right? And that's important. Right? Yeah, yeah. So how did I get into it? Um, I came to Hawaii in 92. I had the great good fortune of being able to work in every single one of the venues here and with wonderful directors and meeting the rest of the acting company. And it wasn't until I started to teach that I think I really began to understand what acting's about. Because you get to watch kids on stage, and you go, oh, man, that's what it means when someone says, don't indicate. Or that's what it means when they say the power of silence. If you just simply stand there and react to what's being, what's being said to you, the audience can project anything they want onto you. You're not doing stuff. You just be silent for a minute. <laughs> That's what you were talking about earlier, what happens between people without language. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's about communication in Absolutely. the finest sense. You know, we talk about communication. All, after all, we're, we're a communication company. And communication is a very complex business. It's what holds the humankind together, actually. Um, and it comes in many ways. And, um, you know, we have a lot of electronic ways that you never even see the face of the individual who is talking to you. But acting 
is the most intense communication of all, isn't it? Well, it's the condensed, it's condensed. It's art is selection. It's not just, you know, improvisation is wonderful, it's fun, it's blah, 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 blah. But acting, some playwright, in our case Shakespeare, who's the best of the bunch, right, has taken and refined and condensed a, an important moment of human communication between two people, right? And it's an actor's job to find out exactly what's being communicated and then find the most effective way to communicate that. And I'll go to a more simple exercise. We were doing this with our um, juniors, our little biddies, last yesterday. <laughs> There's a thing called an open scene. Juniors, what, seventh grade? Sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, All my right, middle school okay. kids. And I give them an open scene, and we're talking about what, as an actor, What's your objective? What are your given circumstances? Where are you? So the questions are, who are you, where are you, what do you want? And in these open scenes, it's something as silly as, hi, hello, are you all right? I guess so. Anyway, it, there, it's like six different exchanges that are completely neutral. Yeah. And I gave it to the kids, and I said, you, tell me what the story is. You've got to decide who the two of you are to each other. That's not given in the text. Where are you? You know, are you in a room? Are you in a field? Are you in the Arctic? What? what and what do you want from each other? And what do the lines tell you you do or do not give each other? All right, so that's the most, and what was funny is we had four pairs, and there were four completely different stories. But that's okay. Oh, that's brilliant, yeah. <laughs> now, what I'm training them, this is my youngest group, this is my middle school group. They, if they want to stay with the program, they move up into the intermediate ensemble, which moves from games and improv and creative dramatics, into text analysis and character creation and working with monologue, monologues and, and scenes. And by the time they finish with that group, they're ready for iambic pentameter and Shakespeare. And that's the high school group. And it's, but the things that kids are dealing with when they're working with Shakespeare is exactly what the kids are dealing with with the open scenes. Sure, sure. He just gives you more tools. Can, can, can kids today do on the stage, iambic pentameter. Absolutely. And can they do it so I won't fall asleep? Absolutely. <laughs> Beautiful point. The reason, and Paul Mitri at UH teaches a wonderful Shakespeare class, a master class for the kids. Um, the reason most people fall asleep when they watch a Shakespeare play is because the actors are generalizing. They know kind of what's happening. They know kind of what they're saying. But if you're sitting in an audience and all of a sudden you find yourself going to sleep, there's been six inches of text that went by on stage <laughs> right. where the actor didn't understand exactly what he was saying, right. why the character picked the words and the phrases that they picked. Right. Right? When you get an actor playing at that level of understanding, you, you don't sleep. Yeah, you yeah. Sleep. So it's all about, um, you know, I, I said before it's about communication, but it's also about the human condition and about uh, psychology. Yeah. And sociology is, is the way people connect in their daily, and, and trying to appreciate what, what Shakespeare, who was like a genius of geniuses, was trying to convey to us, because there's a message in every word. And as you said before, every word is carefully selected for that moment mm -hmm. in time in the play. But uh, some term, terminology, though. You said uh, character, what is it, character, character generation? Create, creation. Creation. Uh -huh. Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça? Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça? Je vais le dire. Um, when you, a lot of times when people come to, come to theater, they think all you have to do to, to act, be on stage, learn the words, say them, play the scene. Well, you can do that, but you'll be very limited because you can only play yourself. And ah. that's not always the most appropriate choice for the situation that a character finds themselves in. Yes. In other words, you, so what we do, we break it for very basic early work. We break it down to three different energies that people play off of. You can call the radiant energy. I tend to pull from that I energy. I love this discussion. I want you to know now. I hope you're taking notes. Go ahead. No, come to my class. <laughs> Don't just take notes. Come take my class. Um, radiant energy, potent energy, which was power and direct and strong. And then there's buoyant, which is, hey, no problem. The world is great. Test tomorrow doesn't matter. Right? And there are people, if you observe, and part of acting is people watching. If you watch people go by or talk or interact, you can identify the energies that they're most comfortable with. So there's which energy does your character is most appropriate. What is the center? Each of us, as we move through our life, as you're walking, a different piece of your body breaks the plane. Some people are head leads. Some people are chest leads, some people are shoulder leads. I've seen a guy walking on Fort Street Mall that's a knee lead, and it's the funniest walk, right? <laughs> some people lead with their feet. But you can create 
if you watch, did you see the program on Steve Martin? Last night? It was a wonderful tribute to him. Each one of his characters has a different lead. And it's so much fun to watch him as an actor yeah. pick and choose from yeah. his box of recipes. Yeah. So there's the center of the lead, the energy, and there was, what was one more? I know there's another one, I'm forgetting it right now. But they're just, and I remember in my Masters of Fine Arts group, I asked a teacher, I'm just supposed to be able to pick a character and then I'll know, my body will know what to do. I'll become that character. Mm. And the director said, that's ideal. Right? You should just be able to morph into whatever situation you're put into. But what happens when you're cast in a role that you don't connect to? What happens in a role where you don't, it, it, it's not me, I can't identify with that person. Then you have to reach into your actor's toolbox. What's an energy that would help? What's, what's a lead? What's a center? What's like me that's like this character? What is not like me that's like this? Anyway, there's a whole bunch of things you can reference that help you, you have to build be, a character. You have to be in touch with yourself and, yes. and with the human condition. But on morphing, I, I want to assure you that here on ThinkTech, we know about morphing. For example, <laughs> yeah, right now, we're going to morph to a break. Watch this. <laughs> Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We brought Aloha. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope that you will tune in and watch the show. It is inspiring and uplifting and educational also. We talk with artists of all different ilk. We talk with them about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, most dear to my heart, why they do it, and it, it never ceases to be fascinating when you get the answer to that question. I hope you'll join us on Center Stage, 2 o'clock Wednesday afternoons. Aloha. Aloha! How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Okay, we're back. We're live. And we have Eden Lee Murray here from Hawaii Theater talking about acting, the human condition, the plays, the thing at the Hawaii Theater. <laughs> yes, sir. So, um, yeah, back, back on the question of character generation. Okay. And I find it amazing. How you, every time I go to a play, every time, uh, and to some extent, not the same extent, but to some extent opera as well, because mm -hmm. they're trying to act, and, and their acting may not be as you know, specifically focused. It's getting as, better and it's better. It's getting better. Yeah. It's true. It's, it's not like the fat lady sings all the time and <laughs> belts it out from center stage. They don't do that the anymore. The daughter of the regiment has to, <laughs> has to weigh less than her horse now, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Good, good. Anyway, uh, so um, you watch it actually and you say, gee, that, that's, I have to remember that's not really him. It's somebody else. He has slipped out of his own skin or converted his own skin into the skin of this character. Mm -hmm. And he has become this other, I mean, it's a good actor now. He has become this person. He wants me to believe he is this person, not, not his real self, or at least his real self modified to be this person. Right. That's hard. How do you do that? You have to construct, like Mr. Potato Man, you have to construct a whole new person in your own mind and act that way. Right. Hard to do. Well, fortunately, if you have a good playwright, Shakespeare being one of the best, a lot of the work is done for you. You've got the tools. Um, a lot of the times, let's see, I wrote something down specifically for you. Um, oh, okay, first, for, well, even more. First, realize that you have a rehearsal process. It's, and creating a character is very much about layering. All right, your first rehearsal is your read through, what's going on here? And then the next one you have to figure out somewhere in there and your director should help you, what's my super objective? In other words, every person lives along a continuum of what do I fear and what do I want? And the character lies between those two extremes. And sometimes they change. And sometimes they change, but for the super objective in the arc of a play, yeah. they don't okay. often. Okay. I mean, it can change from the beginning to it, but the super arc is what does this person want security more than anything else do they fear risk okay there will be a series of choices along the way made on that super objective continuum okay 
Um, so once you figure out your super objective and then you, you go back and you look at your scenes and you do what's called beating out the scenes. Each scene is divided into little pieces of rhythm and each piece of rhythm has an objective. What do I want from you? What are you not going to let me have? So that you, I have an objective, you give me an obstacle based on who I am and a choice that my character would make given what I want and what I fear, I have to pick a strategy that will let me overcome the obstacle you put in my place. Right? And so, again, each rehearsal, you take that a little bit further and you understand that character a little bit better. Right? And I, I, when I talk to my kids, the kids I train, I think of an actor as a... I first of all think acting is a very spiritual business because you are entrusted to give birth to, in the case of a new play, a new being. In the case of a classic, a Shakespeare, for example, I imagine this big cosmic etheric green room somewhere and all of these characters are waiting to be brought back to life uh, in the hands of someone else. Uh, As an actor, it's our job to get out of the way. So it's our job to ask their permission, to channel them, and during the course of the rehearsal process, as a conduit, the actor can feel themselves getting less and less in the way and you create a greater and greater passage for the character to come through and come to life. Doing honor to the character, doing honor to the playwright. It's a huge responsibility. It is, yeah. It's not, and I tell my kids, again, when I train them, I have to tell you, it's not about you. It's not about you. People, you say, oh, people are coming to see me in the play. No, they're coming because you're in the play, but everybody who walks through the door of a theater becomes five years old. I don't care how old they are <laughs> chronologically, and they go, tell me a story. And it's, as an actor, your job is to do everything you can to serve the story, to bring the character as fully to life as possible, to go to the mats for him. And then hopefully, by the end, everybody goes away. What was the phrase that the Greeks used? Catharsized. You've learned something. You're purified. You take something away from the experience that the collective ensemble on stage yeah. has made it their business to give yeah. you. Do, do you actually talk like this when you teach them? I do. Wow. <laughs> it's really, it's a craft. It doesn't necessarily come intuitively. You have to learn a lot of things to be able to act. Well, you have to integrate them into your way of living. It's a good point because I think um, I think you can teach anyone can teach technique upstage, downstage, direct cross, indirect cross, <laughs> off stage, etc. But I think when you're training young actors, especially, right, you're not just training technique. You're working with the holistic child, and you're the you said earlier about getting to know yourself, right? Connecting with yourself, right? Morphing from yourself. First, you know yourself. And to be able to invite another being in, you have to know the difference between them and you. And to do that, you have to know who you are. Yes. And to be a part of a collective, to be a part of an ensemble, and to be able to give focus, you have to know when yourself isn't the most important person happening. So what I teach is I try to... We're building character as well as building characters. Yes, I was going to say that. You, you know, you take a kid who's in the seventh grade, for example, and you put him through this kind of experience, he, he's going to gain maturity right there in, in the four corners of this experience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it's fun for me to watch them grow. Yeah. The little ones especially from sixth to eighth grade. And it's funny, too, because when parents come in to interview, I don't ask an audition for the junior or the intermediate. Um, when they come in for an interview, they'll say, well, my child, he's singing, dancing around the house, the life of the party, center of the attention, you know, joke teller, blah, blah, blah. And I go, can he listen? <laughs> and that's, especially for the extroverts, that's very, uh, the, often people are extroverted because there's a very delicate something inside. And to, for the challenge for the extroverts is to let them feel safe enough to drop that mask or that performance and let what's really interesting come out. Yeah. For the kids who come in introverted, oh, I'm so shy, I can't talk. I'm going, now you're ready, right? Yeah. You're ready to start. And I've watched kids who, they'll come in in, I don't know, September, and little girls, for example, who have the bangs in front of the face, and they stand up against the wall like this. <laughs> By May, the hair's out of the face, and they're, it's not that they're being pushy or bossy, they're just confident. And they value, they begin to value what they have to say. I so it's, it's so you talked a minute about building character, but it's building confidence too, too to communicate, to deal with people as your own self. Know yourself because you have to know yourself to act. Actually, yeah. absolutely. Ooh, this is so interesting. But something I've got to tell you about. Please. We were talking about it. I want it all. All right, there's this little girl. I was telling you. I, I wish I could show you the picture in our Othello. 
the Othello that's coming up this more this this April twenty second, twenty third. It's a different. I mean, it's Elizabethan take. Um, and we every year, what I do with the kids is they all have to create their band of Elizabethan players, and each player has to be male. Which in some years, when I've only had women, has been very helpful. They have to create their male player, and then the oh, male player oh. has to create the role in the show. So they're doing basically a box in a box. This year, I've got half half, which is interesting. Um, but where I was going to go with that is this one little girl who has been with me. Oh no, I was going to say I'm keeping the player illusion, but I didn't know quite. I think. With Shakespeare, you can take in, you can take. There's a huge latitude for interpretation as long as you serve the language and you serve the story. And I, I like to try and find a new way in each time, and I hadn't found it. And in September, this little girl who had come through junior, come through intermediate, came up to me at the reception we had for the first meeting of the group, and she goes, "Would you like to see?" What? She had a little bitty voice. Would you like to see what I did with my summer? And I said, I'd love to. Cassie, Cassie Caldwell is her name. She busts out her cell phone and hits play. And there's Cassie at the circus camp in upstate New York that she's been going to for seven years, way up on the ropes. Circus camp. Doing aerial work. And I'm going, how can I use that in Othello, right? So the concept that evolved from that, Cassie is our uber clown. She is a clown from beyond. She is the storyteller with a capital S. She's the first that you see on stage. She calls to life the lights. She reaches up, and all of a sudden, a silk drops in. Silk, she goes up on the silk. She discovers the audience. She reaches over here, and just sidelight, I went to see a Kenny Endo concert at the theater, 1010. And I was listening to the music. I'm going, that's, that's the muscle for this African hero, right? Okay. Kenny Endo has very kindly let us oh, use his great. music, and he has brought to us a superb member of his ensemble, Yiman Moy, who is also, we call her Man Man. She is doing a live taiko soundscape to, to, to score the set changes, to amplify the fights, the dance, the death of Desdemona, which is Tony Pisculli, who choreographed it, said he'd never seen a more violent death. <laughs> and then you've got the taiko drama just beating like crazy. Anyway, so Cassie runs the show and I would ne we would never if she hadn't had the confidence to say would you like to see what I did with my summer and know that I was going to yeah right? yeah it's a good story so interesting oh <laughs> the questions are spilling <clears throat> you know um so wow so it, there must be a common denominator of the kind of person who comes out to to contact you in the first place is that person uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, an uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, an extrovert uh, or an introvert, but that person wants to be on stage, right? Yes. Not everybody in the world wants to be on stage, and and you ha you have to look for that because that is a measure of the commitment that Absolutely. you will find later. Yeah. What does it look like? This this common denominator of I want to be on stage. All right, that's a wonderful question. It's got lots of levels to it. Um, in the first place, a lot of times, the kids that will show up, and I'm very clear with the audition notice, you have to prepare between one and two minutes of a memorized audition. A lot of the theaters here just let you come in and read cold. And I think you have to step up to the commitment of, you have to prepare and be ready to perform on the stage of the Hawaii Theater. Memorizing lines, if nothing else. Exactly you know? <laughs> right. And I don't ask that the first timers do Shakespeare or classical, but it has to be a play that's published and out there. You can't just stand up and rant. Okay. Um, so there's a group already that present themselves that are ready to make that level of commitment. And then I find a lot of times, not just with the homeschool kids that come out, but there's a very strong fascination with Shakespeare. And they come because they want to do Shakespeare. And for the kids who are in school, I, I've had kids come in from different schools all over the island saying, if people in my class knew I did Shakespeare, I would die. <laughs> they, I would be raised, I would be... Uh, and, yet, and yet, I have to say, these are the kids whose classmates, the teachers bring them when we do the student matinees. And when the kids go back to their schools, it's like they're, they're, they're heroes. And again, it's because they know how to play Shakespeare. Teacher, teachers have responded to me in the past and said, you know... We didn't know how our kids were going to take to this, but they found it so empowering to see their peers 
up on stage at that theater in those costumes playing Shakespeare with confidence and authority. Yeah, yeah. If you can do that, I can do that. Yeah, so it actually affects everybody in the room. Absolutely. It's, it's the notion of, yes, we can do this. Absolutely. And that's fabulous. And you know, <clears throat> a, a, a sort of behind the scenes story for Think Tech is oh. we have people come and do voiceover, you know, and, and when they don't pronounce it right, when they don't get the music right, you know, of the words. Right. We correct them, and then they do it again and again and again, if necessary. Every one of our OC16 shows goes through that. Uh -huh. <clears throat> At the end of the day, I believe they talk differently. And I bet your kids talk differently, too. I mean, they're ordinary lives. They, they're not the same. I have a great quotation for you. Two of my boys, I've got a set of twins. Actually, I have one of a set of twins who's playing Othello, by the way, and doing an amazing, he's my fourth year kid. He's just amazing, Frank Coffey. Um, but two twins who came in as intermediate. No, they came in as junior, then through intermediate, and they played last year Mercutio and Mercutio and Benvolio, and they were wonderful. And Benvolio, who played our Hansel, because I try to give kids professional opportunities when it's appropriate, um, is more the directing. He was the one that was more interested in acting, and he kind of dragged his twin brother, Dylan, Brenton and Dylan <laughs> Cook, dragged Dylan in with it, and Dylan playing... Mercutio last year kind of got bit by the bug yeah. and loved it. And he was, they're both at Kaiser, and he was being sought after by the Kaiser football team because he's a really gifted natural athlete. And he was saying, you know, this is backstage before our final Romeo and Juliet last year. He said, I said, so what are you going to do, Dylan? You're going to go you know, be seduced over there by the football guys who want you a lot, or are you going to come back to us? I might have something fun for you. And he said, you know, I got to tell you, when I come off stage after playing this role in this play, I feel I talk smarter. <laughs> I just feel smarter. <laughs> and what, what, what I think that's a cover for is their discovery of the power of language. You know, we live, we live in a world of, yeah, um, LOL, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> and you and I, who grew up in a... Uh, in, a, in, a, in an era of literacy, personal communication, personal yeah. communication right? <laughs> yeah. We understand that that's just the tip of the iceberg, but a lot of these kids talk fast, speak is what they get, right? right? right. Shakespeare lived that. in an era where people had working vocabularies of between 15 and 20,000 words. Shakespeare himself had a vocabulary of 30,000 words, and when he didn't have le mot juste, just what he wanted, he just makes something up. You know, the expressions, to fall in love, to catch a cold, the word sidewalk, all that's just created from Shakespeare. Yeah, really? Stuff that we use every day. See, see how good he was. He found that, the music. Yes. You know, it's uh, just wonderful. So <clears throat> these kids, these kids can do amazing things. It surprises you, but a part of it has to be the direction. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what kind of experience do you have in directing them? in uh, showing them the message and showing them the objective and showing them the character, you know, creation. You make me almost want to cry. <laughs> I watched a special on Mike Nichols the other day, beautiful director, one, did all kinds of wonderful work, and one of the things he said at the table was, people have no idea the power of when you're working with people in a scene and all of it, because you're doing what Hamlet said, you're holding the mirror up to nature. You're trying, in, in the essence of artifice, which is doing someone else's words, you're trying to get to the truth of something happening between people in the moment. And he said what a thrill it was when it clicks in. We were doing a scene from Othello, one of the big ones, um, in rehearsal the other day. And I, you could have mopped the floor with me because these kids absolutely clicked in and caught it. And it's just... And that, it's, I have got to see this play. You do. See this production. You do. Everybody. Yes. Yeah. No. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other thing that comes to me. I mean, a lot of things flood into me as you're talking. <clears throat> is that when they go through a lot of this is options, options, mm -hmm. and options is the human condition. So I am faced with a problem I've never seen before. I am faced with choices that are, you know, that are Sophie's choices, dilemma situations, and I, as the character, have to make my decision. And as in great literature, sometimes I make the wrong, as in life, sometimes I make the wrong decision. And these kids are going, if they understand it, they're going through the decision process yes. just the way the character does. Yes. So they learn about thinking, they learn about options, they learn about making choices right there in the play. 
the place a thing. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. The place a thing. We take a short break. We'll be right back with Eden Lee Murray. You will see. We'll learn some more. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and one of our delights is to be partnered with Think Tech Hawaii and produce programs every week. Every Monday at 2 o'clock, we have a show called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. So we bring people from all across the nation and the country, and certainly throughout the islands together here to talk with them about how to work together, and how to work together to do the following, to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. So if you're interested in the research of our think tank, the Grassroot Institute, or if you're interested in how that's applied at the governmental and community and business levels, you'll enjoy the fascinating conversations with our guests on Ehana Kako every week on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock on Mondays. Until our next show, I'll see you. <laughs> Aloha. It happened again. <laughs> <laughs> Even Lee Murray and I had a fantastic conversation during the break, and you were not there. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> Instant replay. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about coffee. All right. <laughs> All right, Frank Coffee is playing our Othello. He came into the company four years ago. He was, I started to tell you, as this reedy, wonderful, dancing, totally free, completely uninhibited young performer, beautiful boy, freshman. And he did for his audition, The Cow Over the Moon from Rent. And he just soared. He just rocked it, right? Because he was fearless, even then. And I said, I got to have this in this company. And yeah. that year, he played Gildenstern in our Hamlet and was very, f he, he walked a fine line of finding the truth of the character and still finding the comedy of it. Because I think when directing comedy, you have to look for the tragedy. When you're directing sure. tragedy, you've got to find the funny. Sure, so it's true, there, so right? true, so true. So Frank, then next year, he was in our Much Ado About Nothing, and he played Baraccio, who's the drunken villain who sets up Hero to go down, to be killed. He betrays her, really. And then he gets put in the stocks, and the character has to come to a sense of self-realization. And what Frank and I worked out, and I just, I put this to him in a note, I said, you know, pay attention to the fact that Baraccio hasn't had a drink for 24 hours and up to then he's been drunk 24 hours 7 right he's had 24 hours to think about what he did all right so how does that affect your last scene and he boy he came right in he was f at the first part of the play funny drunk totally selfish got it that set he just he brought me to tears by his self perception right and I'm going and that's a that's a fairly there are no small parts but that's a fairly small part so last year, I threw him in his Romeo, and he was just, he was a lover, he was whimsical, he was lyrical, and he's this wonder, we had, how do you make the Capulets different from the Montagues? Well, there's Romeo, who is of a dark coffee color, and you've got Juliet, who is this China porcelain skinned oh, redhead, interesting. and they were, and they were also best this friends. This is not necessarily in the play. Uh, or, or, well, they, they're different for a reason. They're, they're different. And we, we, just found say our, they're different. We, we found our reason. So and found then, your reason. And the reason okay. for which different sides would want them yeah. not to be together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it yeah, worked. Sure, it and, works. And because the two of them were just Becomes so... Because racial <laughs> I love that. Well, and it's an interesting <laughs> precedent. Attention. Yeah. And then you go into Othello, which is every bit as racial. Sure. In that you've got black Othello, Moore, who's done wonderful heroic deeds to save Venice, and they love him as long as he doesn't marry one of theirs. <laughs> well, not only does he marry yeah, one of theirs. Could this be the 21st century? <laughs> he marries one of theirs, he elopes with one of theirs, and guess what? She's the only daughter of a very white Venetian senator. So I, I went to Frank. I saw Frank. You asked me how I pulled this together. Frank yeah. and uh, Nick Brown, both, yeah. ha both Waldorf students. Um, I sometimes, the year before I do a play, I'll test pairings out with something that we do in, just in December called Evening with the Bard, where all of the kids work on Shakespeare scenes through the first semester, putting what they learn from the eight very special master classes straight to work, and then they go up. And I paired Frank with Nick on the first scene, the, the scene in the fellow where Iago first begins to drop the poison about the jealousy, right, about Desdemona may be faithless with Cassio. And the two of them went to town on it, and it was so good. And that actually came from Frank bringing in as an audition a piece from Othello, thinking to his mother, you know, she knows I can be funny, but does she know I can do Othello? And he, he went for it, right? So he and Nick were, and I went from that time, he still had to get through Romeo at that point, but that was the moment that I chose to do Othello 
this year. And I didn't know I had a Desdemona until a little girl who was the second year time this year brought in a beautiful, she played a smaller role in Romeo and Juliet and then just grew miles as an actress during the course of the year. She brought in a beautiful Joan of Arc monologue. And I went, there's Desdemona, right? And then I had the rest of the, the fall semester to watch them and see who works well with each other, who does work outside of class, who does the extra mile. These are my principals, these are my so players. You as a director have to see the whole thing taking yeah. place. You have to see the entire landscape and then you put the people in the pukas. And um, sometimes this is a it's very just, creative experience for you. You bet. And sometimes it's like, of course. And other times it's like, well, why not? You know, and like yeah. the, with, with Cassie up on the silks, it's like, where did that come from? But yeah. yes, it's right. It's a moment, a moment of clarity, what? <laughs> and I live for those, right? And yeah, so, yeah. so in terms of the race, racial thing, um, I went to, I had to, I deliberately asked Alana, Frank's mother, permission when I said, I'm going to cast him as Othello, and she knew that. And I said, I want to talk with you before we move into rehearsals. And she went, because when you talk to a mother about needing to meet with her about her child, then it's yeah, like, oh, eh. yeah. she goes, What's he done wrong? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I just wanted to clear with you. I believe the play is inherently racist, and I believe to take Frank into that role, you have to take him into the tragedy of a black man in a white society who, no matter how wonderful he is, how heroic he is, how selfless he is to help him, he's a black man in a white society, and when he begins to act out against Desdemona, <clears throat> nobody else knows that it's Iago poisoning the well here, but... Everybody in Venice, oh, I see, that's what was going to happen all along. And he becomes, I think the role is profoundly lonely. And I said to Alana, I'm going to, you can't play that role unless you play it, unless you go there, right? And, I, and she goes, thank you for asking me and do what you will, right? And he's, what's fun too with Frank is at the beginning of rehearsals, he still had Romeo in his body, which often happens with actors, right? You, the, you're during the last role that you did. That was the last. That's what you converted to. Well, that, yeah. and they're not letting you go. Yeah. They had so much fun on stage that the next time you're up on stage, yeah. they're still with you. Yeah, really. So Frank had his light on his feet, light of very yeah. whimsical, lyrical Romeo. Yeah, and I said, yeah, Frank, yeah. different center of the body, different carriage of weight. He's, a, he's an athlete. Yeah. He's a warrior. He yeah. is weight. He's older than Desdemona. He... When the two of them first meet after the big storm at sea, he went scampering across the stage in the first rehearsal and gave her a big hug. I said, stop, okay. That was Romeo greeting Juliet. Rewind, I want to see Othello get off that boat. And he went, he knew exactly what I meant. And the weight shifted back, the shoulders squared, he got heavy, and the voice changed. Everything shifted. So his... He's a his, natural. He really is. He's and he works really hard. So what's the, uh, for that character, let's, you know, the, the lead character, the title character of that play, what, what is his um, quest? What is his message? Uh, what is his dynamic through the play? All right, well, it starts... So I, I want to sort of get them interested. Maybe good. they'll go, yeah. Good, good, good. It starts out very simple. I mean, he's a warrior. He's undefeated. He's brave. He's, he's esteemed by all in the society he's chosen to enter. And he's assuming that's the way it's going to go. This beautiful white woman who could have anybody in her echelon, in her cast, picks him. The world is great. Now, the first little tiny down cut is when the Turks invade Cyprus, and he has to be sent on his wedding night, without the benefit of the wedding night, over to take and fortify Cyprus. Well, Desdemona insists on coming right along with him, which is fine, as does Iago, as does Iago's wife. And we're in Cyprus, and all is good. Meanwhile, the audience has been treated to soliloquies from Iago, who has been, and this is not answered as to why, Iago was in line for promotion to be the right-hand man of Othello, and he's come through battles with him, and he's, he's a, str str what do you call it, strategist? And he's, a trusted, a and trusted, a trusted lieutenant. And a trusted lieutenant, not even, yes, he is the lieutenant. But Cassio, this young, strapping, white, masculine, blonde, in our case, gets bumped up ahead of him. This is maybe a, a West Point soldier who hasn't been in the field at all, but he's, it looks great on paper. Iago, and this is an interesting thing that we've been experimenting with in the in rehearsal process. In Shakespeare, it's argued that Iago is a villain for the sake of being a villain. He's just a bad guy, just bad. And I think that's not interesting for an actor to play. I think... He has to have a dynamic, too. Why? And we were thinking, one of the things we played with is, okay, if Iago and Othello have been through the wars, a number of battles, they had each other's back, 
they've seen atrocities, they've seen lances go through bodies, they've, they have everything together and they can say anything to each other. Othello continues to say anything to Iago. Iago believes, and whether you call it a bromance, whether there's a love on some level, we're not playing with the homosexual aspect of it at all, but you could argue that there's, he, Iago trusts Othello and then Othello turns around and betrays him on two fronts. One, he pushes Cassio over him, he promotes him, and two, he marries Desdemona. Now, for Othello, the person that he confided in, that he was everything to, that takes a direct U-turn to this young, beautiful, white woman, right? And Iago, for two reasons now, is left in the lurch completely. Now, you go to Hell Hath No Fury as a woman scorned, Iago is scorned, seriously. And we even argued that the relationship at the, at the start, before the play begins, of Iago Othello is the strongest in the play, and it gets savvy, it gets ruined. So then, Iago, I hate the Moor. It and turns he, to hatred. He absolutely, and he resolves after the play, as the play begins, you understand, and he tells Iago masks to eat. He sort of tells the truth to, to Rodrigo, because Rodrigo's kind of dumb. He doesn't bother lying to Amelia, because Amelia is his wife, who perhaps he once loved, and she remembers being loved, but he's pulled away from her because Gosh. of post-traumatic traumatic stress syndrome, right? He's put all of his affection into Othello, and Othello has betrayed him on every front, right? So the only person, so you asked me, well, just think, the only person that Iago tells the truth to is the audience. And he uh, is in is direct he, relationship. Does he turn to the audience? He breaks the fourth wall again and again. And he tells the audience exactly what's just happened, exactly what he plans to do. He's like a spider. And he weaves. He doesn't know it's going to work at the beginning. But his arc is you watch him get more and more powerful as each piece falls into place. And you see him become more and more shameless about lying straight to someone's face and then winking at the audience. You see what I just did? It works. Right? Wow. It's brilliant, it's right? Brilliant. But then at the end, he loses. Spoiler alert. Mm. He doesn't. Okay, stop there. Uh, see, stop there. Uh, uh, now, <clears throat> you're starting to get the idea about how complex this is, but how interesting it is, and how much you can learn from it, and how these kids have flowered out, oh. you know, in this, this lovely environment of um, being exposed to acting in their lives. It's fabulous. I love the kids of Hawaii, and I love what you're doing with oh, them. Thank you. And I love the coffee family, too. <laughs> Frank is just doing yeoman's work, right? Yeah. Surrounded by a phenomenal yeah. cast. His testimony gives him as good as she gets. Eagle Lee Murray, I'll be there. Good! Count on it, and you'll be here again, right? <laughs> I hope so. Give us a postscript after, after the show, and we can talk about how it unfolded, and maybe talk about your next one, too. I would love that. Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay. Next year, this deal, time next year. Deal, deal, deal. <laughs> Thank you, Eagle Lee Thank Murray. you, sir. Lovely to have you.